Hey there! Ready for a deep dive into the fascinating world of Mitcham Common. We're about to uncover some surprising secrets hidden in plain sight. And we've got the perfect guide for this botanical adventure, these incredible booklets by local expert Janet Morris, overflowing with her personal observations and stunning photos. Get ready to see Mitcham Common's plant life in a whole new light. Absolutely. You know, what's so captivating about Mitcham Common is its ability to challenge our perceptions. Mm. We often think of plants as these delicate things, but the ones we're about to explore, they've thrived in a surprisingly tough environment. Okay, paint a picture for us. What makes Mitcham Common such a challenge for these plants? Imagine a landscape that's more rugged than romantic. We're talking acid grassland, dryness, constant wind. Not exactly a walk in the park. But that's what makes the plants featured in Janet's booklets so intriguing. They're survivors, carving out their niche in a place where many wouldn't dare to grow. So we're not talking about your delicate ferns seeking shade in a rainforest. These are the tough cookies of the plant world. Precisely. And their resilience is only the tip of the iceberg. What's truly fascinating is how these seemingly ordinary plants have been intertwined with human lives for centuries often in unexpected ways. Okay, you've piqued my curiosity. Hit us with the first surprise. What hidden wonder have we got in store? Let's start with a plan you've probably seen countless times without giving it a second thought. The bulrush. Those tall reeds you often find near water's edge. Yeah, those, they always make me think of that poem, The Charge of the Light Brigade, you know, half a league, half a league. But you're telling me there's more to these reeds than meets the eye. Much more. While they might seem commonplace today, the bulrush, or Typha latifolia to be precise, has a history that stretches back to the Paleolithic era. We're talking about our ancient ancestors relying on this plant for sustenance. Whoa, hold on. So cavemen were munching on bulrushes. What part of the plant were they eating? The stalks. Not quite the stalks, but you're close. It's the rhizomes, those underground stems. Packed with starch, they were ground into flour, used as a thickener in cooking even woven into mats and baskets. Wow, it's amazing how resourceful people were. Finding all these uses for a plan that most of us just walk past today makes you wonder what other hidden treasures are out there. And that's just scratching the surface. Even the use of bulrushes as a building material has a modern parallel. Remember how we talked about its insulating properties? Yeah, you said something about using it for stuffing and even insulation, right? A far cry from our modern material. Exactly, but think about it. We're seeing a resurgence of interest in natural, sustainable building materials. Suddenly, the humble bulrush, with its history rooted in ancient ingenuity, doesn't seem so far removed from modern innovations. That's such a cool connection. It's like history repeating itself, but with a modern twist. <laughs> okay, I'm ready for the next plant. What other secrets are we uncovering today? Let's dive into the world of herbal remedies with a plant that has a rather intriguing name. Ladies Bed Straw. Any guesses as to what it might have been used for? Okay, given the name, I'm going to go out on a limb here and say, got beds. Maybe mattresses. Was it like the ancient equivalent of a comfy pillow top? You're spot on. Our ancestors weren't exactly sleeping on memory foam, so they had to get creative. Dried ladies' bed straw, or gallium verum, was a common mattress stuffer, adding a bit of comfort and a sweet hay-like fragrance to their beds. That's fascinating, but you said it was also used for herbal remedies. Was it like a sleep aid, maybe something to ward off nightmares? Not quite, though a good night's sleep is always a bonus. Ladies' bed straw was prized for its medicinal properties, used to treat a whole host of ailments from skin conditions to digestive issues. Imagine the experimentation and observation it took to discover those uses. It's mind-blowing when you think about it. No fancy labs or clinical trials back then, just trial and error, passed down through generations. Talk about trusting your ancestors. Exactly. And it wasn't just about practicality. Ladies' bed straw, with its delicate white flowers, also held cultural significance. In some cultures, it was associated with luck and protection, often woven into bridal bouquets or hung over doorways. Wow, so much symbolism packed into this humble plant. <laughs> okay, before we get too caught up in the magic of ladies' bed straw, what other intriguing plant awaits us on this botanical journey? Let's shift gears from the practical to the visually striking. Have you ever come across Great Mullen on your walks? You know, now that you mention it, I think I have. Is it the one with the tall, fuzzy stalks that almost look like torches? I remember seeing them on a hike once and thinking they looked almost prehistoric. That's the one. Verbascum thapsus, or Great Mullen, has a presence that's hard to ignore, but it's more than just a pretty face in the plant world. I bet. With a name like Great Mullen, it has to have some epic stories attached to it. Was it used in ancient battles? 
Did warriors use those stalks as weapons? Not quite a weapon, but you're getting closer to its historical uses. Those tall, dried stalks dipped in tallow or wax were actually used as torches. Imagine walking through the darkness with a great Malayan torch lighting your way. Okay, that's pretty darn cool. It's like something out of a fantasy novel. But you said it was more than just a torch, right? What other secrets does this plant hold? Okay, we're back. Yeah. And we've only just scratched the surface of Mitchum Commons' botanical wonders, ready to delve deeper. Absolutely. And this time, let's shift our focus from individual plants to the bigger picture of Mitchum Commons' history. Because, believe it or not, this seemingly tranquil landscape has a past that's as vibrant and resilient as the plants that call it home. You've got that right. We've got Janet Morris's book, Mitchum Common, A Short History, right here. And looking through these pages, it's amazing to see how this land has transformed over time. I'm ready for a history lesson Mitchum Common style. Well, prepare to be surprised because the story of Mitchum Common isn't your typical walk through a peaceful park. Imagine, if you will, a landscape caught in a constant tug of war between those who sought to exploit it and those who fought tirelessly to protect it. Okay, now you're really painting a picture. I never realized this tranquil haven had such a tumultuous past. Give us a taste of the drama. What were some of the biggest threats Mitchum Common faced? Imagine this. It's the 19th century, and London is expanding rapidly. Open spaces are becoming increasingly valuable. And Mitchum Common, with its sprawling grasslands and woodlands, is eyed greedily by developers. Oh, no. So they were going to turn this natural haven into rows of houses. Did anyone stand up for the common? They did, indeed. This is where the story of Mitchum Common takes an inspiring turn. Local residents, recognizing the immense value of this green space, banded together to protect it. That's amazing. People power in action. What did they do? Did they stage protests? Chain themselves to trees? It was a multifaceted battle. Fueled by passion and determination, they formed committees, lobbied politicians, and most importantly, they refused to let the commons' fate be decided without their say. Okay, I'm already feeling inspired by these 19th century activists. Their fight to save the common reminds me of those old newsreels, you know, with people holding signs and chanting slogans. But their efforts paid off, right? They did though it was far from a quick victory. The fight to protect Mitchum Common spanned decades, with each generation facing its own unique challenges. So it wasn't just a one and done kind of deal. These threats kept popping up. Exactly. In the early 20th century, as London continued to grow, a new threat emerged. Rubbish. Rubbish. Like, people were just dumping their trash on Mitchum Common. I thought those were supposed to be the good old days. Not so much for Mitchum Common. With limited options for waste disposal, parts of the common were transformed into makeshift rubbish dumps. Oh no, that's awful. What a nightmare for the plants and animals. And I bet it didn't smell so great either. What did people do about that? The same spirit of activism that saved the common from developers rose to the challenge once again. This time they focused on raising awareness about the environmental impact of the dumping. So they were ahead of their time, these Mitchum common defenders. It's like they were the original eco-warriors. Did they manage to stop the dumping? Eventually, yes but not without a fight. It took years of campaigning, petitioning local authorities, and even organizing community cleanup days to finally put an end to the dumping. Talk about dedication. I'm starting to think that the real treasure of Mitchum Common isn't just its plants, but the people who fought so hard to protect it. You're absolutely right. And that brings us to one of the most dramatic chapters in Mitchum Common's history, the transformation of Mill Hill. Okay, Mill Hill. That name rings a bell. Is that the part of the common with those rolling hills that look like they've been there forever? Those very hills. But what you see today, those picturesque slopes covered in wildflowers, mm -hmm. were once, well, a rubbish dump. Whoa, seriously? You're telling me those beautiful hills were built on top of trash? It sounds unbelievable, but it's true. After the dumping finally stopped, the challenge was figuring out what to do with those mountains of rubbish. I can only imagine the brainstorming sessions. What did they come up with? It was a bold and innovative solution. Mm. They decided to literally reshape the landscape. Okay, now I'm really intrigued. How do you reshape a landscape that's essentially a giant pile of trash? It was an enormous undertaking. Yeah. They started by covering the rubbish with a thick layer of clay, essentially sealing it off. Then came the real artistry they used that clay to sculpt those rolling hills we see today. It's like a giant earth-moving art project. Did they just leave those clay hills bare or did they plant things on them? Transforming those barren slopes into a thriving landscape was no easy feat. They had to carefully choose plants that could tolerate the challenging conditions. Poor soil. Exposure to the elements. 
and the constant threat of erosion. I bet it took a special kind of plant to handle all that. So what did they choose? Did they go with super tough grasses or maybe some kind of hardy shrubs? They opted for a mix of species, a carefully curated palette of plants that would not only survive, but thrive in this unique environment. There were grasses, yes, but also wildflowers, shrubs, and even trees, all chosen for their resilience and their ability to create a diverse and visually stunning landscape. Okay, I have to ask, how long did this massive makeover take? I'm picturing decades of work. It was a long and gradual process, a testament to the dedication of the people involved. They started in the 1960s, and it wasn't until the late 1970s that the transformation of Mill Hill was truly complete. Wow, that's a serious commitment to restoring the land. So, from rubbish dump to rolling hills, I'm starting to see why this place is so special. And that's just a glimpse into the remarkable history of this place. We haven't even touched upon the fascinating characters, the passionate debates, and the ongoing efforts to ensure that Mitcham Common continues to thrive for generations to come. Okay, you've definitely piqued my curiosity. Now I'm dying to know more about those characters and debates. Well, then let's delve deeper into the heart of this remarkable landscape and uncover more of its hidden stories. Lead the way. I'm ready for more Mitchum Common Magic. We're back and you know what they say, third time's the charm. Ready to wrap up our deep dive into the ever-evolving story of Mitchum Common. Absolutely, and this chapter might just hold the most valuable lesson of all, the enduring power of community. Okay, I'm intrigued. We've journeyed through ancient plant uses, battled rubbish heaps, and witnessed the rebirth of Mill Hill. What's next in this epic saga? Well, remember how we talked about those persistent financial woes that seemed to plague the conservators? Yeah, it felt like every time they'd solve one problem, another financial crisis would pop up. Exactly, and those pressures didn't magically disappear. In fact, by the late 20th century, things had gotten, well, let's just say creative. Okay, now you've got to give us the details. What did they come up with? Did they start charging admission, selling naming rights to the trees? Not quite. One idea that sparked quite the debate was the proposal to allow Sunday markets on a section of the common. Sunday markets. I can see the appeal. Huh. Fresh produce, local crafts, maybe even some live music. Sounds like a lovely way to spend a Sunday afternoon. It does, doesn't it? But not everyone shared that enthusiasm. Ah, uh, I see where this is going. Clash of visions. The bustling market versus the tranquil green space. Precisely. There were concerns about noise pollution, increased traffic, and the potential for litter. Not to mention, some worried about the disruption to the commons' delicate ecosystem. It's that age-old dilemma, finding a way to balance the needs of the community with the need to protect this precious green space. So what happened? Did those Sunday markets ever get the green light? They did, but not without a fight. The debate raged on, with passionate arguments from both sides. In the end, they reached a compromise. A limited number of Sunday markets each year, held in a designated area, and with strict guidelines to minimize their impact. A classic Mitchum Common solution, balancing act at its finest. But did those Sunday market profits solve their financial woes? Sadly, no. Managing a landscape as vast and dynamic as Mitcham Common requires significant funding, and those Sunday markets, while helpful, weren't the magic solution they'd hoped for. So the struggle continued. But you know what constantly strikes me about this story is the unwavering dedication of those involved. Makes you wonder, who actually calls the shots when it comes to Mitcham Common? Is it the local council or some government agency? That's a fantastic question, and it gets to the heart of what makes Mitcham Common truly unique. Unlike many green spaces, which are owned and managed by local authorities, Mitcham Common marches to the beat of its own drum. Okay, you've piqued my curiosity. Tell me more about this independent streak. It all goes back to those feisty 19th century residents we talked about earlier, the ones who fiercely defended the common from those greedy developers. Ah, those heroes. They didn't just fight off one threat, they established a legacy. They successfully lobbied for the creation of the Board of Conservators, an independent body solely dedicated to managing and preserving Mitcham Common. Wow, so they basically created their own mini government, just for the common. Talk about taking matters into your own hands. Exactly. And this Board of Conservators, fueled by community passion, has been steering the ship ever since, navigating financial storms, advocating for the commons' protection, and ensuring that it remains a thriving haven for generations to come. That is seriously inspiring. It really speaks to the power of community, don't you think? The belief that some places are just too precious to be left solely to the whims of government or developers. Absolutely. Yeah. And that's what elevates Mitcham Common beyond just a green space. It's a living, breathing testament to that community spirit. 
a symbol that even amidst the relentless crush of urban life, nature can not only survive, but flourish when people rally to its defense. You know, I think that's the perfect note to end on. We dove into this deep dive expecting to unearth the secrets of plants, and we ended up discovering something far more profound. We did, didn't we? It's incredible how a single topic, like the plants of Mitcham Common, can unfurl into this tapestry of resilience, community, and the unbreakable bond between humans and nature. It's a reminder that every leaf, every path, every twist and turn of this landscape holds a story, a whisper of history just waiting to be heard. So the next time you find yourself strolling through Mitcham Common, take a moment to appreciate the legacy of those who fought to protect it. Because their story, much like the plants that thrive on this land, is a testament to the enduring power of nature and the unwavering spirit of community. Couldn't have said it better myself. Thank you for joining us on this incredible journey through Mitcham Common. Until next time.